Welcome, heathens and witches. We're back for the Horn and Cauldron podcast. podcast. Yeah, I'm John Norgrove. This is Julie Norgrove. And um, it is in bulk. Like today. Like actually today. Woo. So we're going to talk about in bulk. Yeah. Take it away. Uh, well, <laughs> before getting into this, I was like, oh, in bulk's kind of like one of those boring ones. Like it's going to be hard for me to like find a lot of information for sure, sure. you know for like a full show yeah but when i started looking into it i fell down the deepest research rabbit hole uh and actually found a bunch of really interesting things uh some of which we'll talk about here and some of which we'll talk about in future shows so um first off in bulk is also called saint brigade's day mm -hmm. and uh the um you know, it's not to be confused with Candlemas. That's typically ce celebrated on February 2nd, which is tomorrow, uh, as well as Groundhog Day is tomorrow. So there's kind of like a whole bunch of little things that get mushed together in this like couple of day span. Sure, sure, And totally. Imbolc typically takes place on February 1st, which is about halfway between the solstice and the spring equinox. Okay. <clears throat> so... The dates would have changed, um, you know, based on, you know, like, uh, you know, when they real, you know, when like ancient peoples realized like, oh, like we're about halfway, you know, we have like about, you know, we have more light and, you know, animals are starting to lay again. Um, and like have babies and and stuff and that's actually kind of seen with the way that this word is put together so in bulk is um is they don't actually know exactly where the word comes from like we did with like we did with the word yule but in bulk is kind of like a amalgamation of several different words uh, that are kind of like in that thing. So some etymologists think that it comes from the old Irish imbfolk, which is to wash or cleanse oneself. Uh, some people think it comes from, oh boy, imbiglogun, imbigbolgun. You want to try that one? Imbibulgan? Sure. Which means budding. Yeah. <laughs> or oil milk, which means use milk. And yeah. these ideas really make sense oil because milk. Yeah. yeah, oil milk. <laughs> yeah. Oil <Oy> milk. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's more it's it's more like ran together <clears throat> when yeah, I hear milk. this pronounced. It's sort of like oil milk. Yeah. You know, almost like uh like the E isn't as hard as when we say like mm -hmm. milk. You know, as Americans we say sounds pretty harshly. Yeah, we milk. do. You know, it's milk. like, say 100% of the letters in that. Unless it's like aluminum. And then we just well. fucking gave up. <laughs> we decided not to add 27 uh, yeah. additional consonants to that word like uh, some people do. Well, it's like... <laughs> the Brits. <laughs> <laughs> or the Germans. It's like yeah. that German Germans. meme where it's like love, like everything in German is terrifying. Like yeah. even the word love. <laughs> I mean, you got to bring out the Fugelkankleimen. So, yeah. You know that reference? Dogs? <laughs> <laughs> Euro trip. Such a great uh, fucking movie too. So, I mean, really, these ideas behind where the word comes from and what time of year it is and the way that this festival is kind of celebrated really makes sense because Imbolc is really just a festival that marks the beginning of spring. Um, you know, right around like just a couple of days ago, our chickens started laying like an egg, like almost an egg a day. So instead of being like one egg every other day, like in the darkest of the winter months, now we're getting an egg a day from the girls that lay every single day. And we're getting just like a, we went from half an egg on average a day to four eggs on average a day in the span of like a week. It's pretty nutty. So, um, you know, this is also a time when, when uh, lambs and other animals start to have calves and stuff like that, and uh, milk-bearing animals start to give milk again if they take time off during the winter. Some do and some don't. Um, and Imbolc has been um, celebrated since the, as early as the 10th century. So we're looking at actually a really old celebration, and I did not realize that. I thought that this was one of those ones that came about through Wicca, which is uh, primarily a religion that was introduced in the later 20th century. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I had to get like a little, little sip of my libation there. 
yeah, gotta do it. So <clears throat> it's thought that people have actually been celebrating in bulk since the Neolithic period. And we talked about this in a previous episode and I don't remember which one, probably Yule. The Neolithic period goes from 10,000 BCE to 4,500 BCE. Um, so it's thought that Imbolc has been celebrated for a really, really, really long time. And I would not have guessed that before I started doing some research. And the reason that we think that is actually because of these uh, structures that are called passage tombs or passage graves. Uh, and this was super interesting. If you guys are interested in like ancient architecture or any of this kind of stuff like give it a google for passage tombs and passage graves you'll find a lot of really interesting stuff um passage tombs are um they're basically they're basically like sort of like a mausoleum almost but they're made up of huge rocks so when you think neolithic period you want to think big huge structures you know you're thinking moving giant rocks over long distances not quite stonehenge because stonehenge is actually older than the neolithic period but like think of it as like a much a slightly smaller stonehenge same thing for easter island easter island's well, a bit older and too. stonehenge went through like five iterations yeah yeah right so stonehenge has um you know, before it was Stonehenge, it was, it was, there was basically, like, wooden posts there. So, yeah. like, that spot has been used for a long time, but, like, necessarily the stones that you're looking at, since you can't go up to them and touch them no more, uh, or at least the last time I was over there, you couldn't, um, those are less old than the site itself. <coughs> right? Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's really the difference there, you know? Uh, but, yeah, the, these... These passage tombs are a lot like uh, mound graves all over the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and like, uh, sort of like mountain cavern, like catacomb style mm -hmm. graves that you see up in like Germany and such like that. I've I've been to a couple. Mm -hmm. You've certainly driven past, like I've been on the tour bus when you're driving past like a bunch of <laughs> rolling hills and the tour guide's like, look at all these beautiful rolling hills and everybody's like, oh my God, oh. Photos and he's like, these are all graves, and you're just like, Ooh, maybe not photos, but kind of dope. And then he's like, let me explain them to you. And then by the end of the explanation, you're like, oh my god, this is dope, more photos. You know, I've, I've traveled to Europe several times. That would be so. super me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So um basically, they took these huge rocks and they arranged them in such a way so as to create an inner chamber. And the roof of these passage tombs was sometimes earth, so they kind of look like super ancient hobbit holes, which like I'm really into. Um, but some of them were covered with other stones and some of them have evidence that they were covered with other things such as timber and, um, possibly straw and thatched roofs. So not all of them are set inside of like a hill or a mountain or something like that, but they are all arranged in such a way so that the sun shines through the entrance or passage uh, on, at a very specific point of the year into the inner chamber. So if you are walking into a passage grave, imagine that you're walking into a structure that's set into the earth. It looks kind of like a hobbit hole, but it's made out of rocks. And you can see the rocks all the way around it. So it's just kind of got like an earthen roof. <clears throat> and when you do that, you're walking in through a passage and then once you've gone inside the passage and some of these passages were really short, like two or three feet. And some of them were really long, like 40 feet long, guys. Uh, super, super long. And uh, and the sun would shine in just like that scene in... Um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yep. As well as several other things. But it's definitely Raiders of the Lost Ark that I'm thinking. Not like the scene from The Fifth Element, unless you're trying to pay some kid to sit there and Aziz light. Aziz light. But uh, yeah, people die, so that's not gonna last super long. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and the interesting thing about the lighting part is, not only did these people, literally thousands of years ago, millennia ago, have the ability to create a structure like that, but that they did it so that the sun would shine in on, for instance, sunrise at Imbolc yeah. or sunset on um, Samhain, which is in October, well, for us in the Northern Hemisphere anyway. Um, so it's, it's really an interesting feat of architecture 
to think about you know you think about people like thousands of years ago not being as sophisticated but like i mean that that's a lot of work and calculation i couldn't even begin to understand what kind of math that would make like do you, what do you do you like draw a line or something and then you just build well, around it you 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 <coughs> time out when sunrise and sunsets over a series of days, right? And, uh, you know, I mean, the thing is, is that they don't have to be that exact, right? Yeah. Because, like, theoretically... I mean, you've got, like, a whole doorway, I guess. Yeah, you've got yeah. a whole doorway. You know, it's not like a, like a laser of light <laughs> pointing at a symbol to activate a crystal or some <clears> shit. <throat> Um, but no, you know, as a general rule, and maybe one day, maybe I'll do this for a, for a, um, Philosophize oh, Friday. Maybe I'll do it for a Philosophize Friday one of these days. It's, we have this cultural, like, idea that the ancient people were incapable of doing some of the things that we can do. First, the fuck of all, like, I can't, like, even with all this technology and I'm like, scary good at math and shit like i would have a difficult time i'm not saying i could do it you know but like i can't do it right now off the top of my head man but like i would have a difficult time setting up something like that mm -hmm. um even now it would be more work theoretic you know more yeah. work than i'm capable of doing currently theoretically um but like the ancients weren't incapable of making extreme calculations or like understanding mm -hmm. things greatly or anything like that i mean it um it's sort of one of those things that you watch the, you watch the history channel specials right <laughs> and they're I'm, like I'm how gonna, did they gonna, make a perfectly yeah, straight I'm, line yeah, five thousand years ago i'm not ago. trying to put them on blast but they're fucking idiots right when they're just <laughs> like no full ass open openness right here all right it's <laughs> <clears throat> the dumbest thing you can do is undermine or or not believe in some person because it was 5,000 years ago. Like, yeah, that guy 5,000 years ago or that chick 5,000 years ago couldn't have Googled the sun's position fucking whatever. But, I, I mean, they have as much time as you do and significantly less of this shit taking up your time you know so learning something like that's more than a reasonable skill you know and you see it's 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 always the ancient alien shows right when they're just like clearly mankind couldn't have done this aliens but like <laughs> wasn't aliens right but aliens like it was just people because they had the time and the passion uh and, they and certainly or the courage didn't have the internet right and the and and they if they didn't know it right they learned it or they figured it out we've all had that situation where you try to do something whether it's cooking a stew and you don't have an ingredient or building a, a building a shelf or something and you don't have the right fasteners or, or the right pieces of lumber you know and so you, you gotta hobble something together or what have you i mean people were able to do that and unless you're building something with hyper precision i mean pi can be three it's close enough for a bunch of stuff. Is it close enough for eighth grade math? No. You're going to get kicked. <laughs> the teacher's just going to kick you. Right? Is it close enough to send a man to the moon? No. He is going to miss the moon. It is going to be bad. He's just going to be in fucking space. Right? Just no chance in hell of hitting his target. Right? But is it good enough for, like, a four-foot-tall pile of rocks? I mean, yeah. It, it is. Yeah. yeah. Right? Like... Sometimes we we build ourselves up to be better simply because of the simplicity with which we perceive our life to be in. But um, that simplicity sort of dulls us to the to the grandeur of what we can do whilst focused. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it, it, it sort of all comes back to I have this this uh, saying belief structure whatever. It's sort of like do one thing at a time. Everybody wants to do. Uh, do these three things, multitask, multi, do one thing at a time and focus on it and pay attention to it and do it slowly and, and give yourself to it and then move on to the next task and move on to the next task, you know, and that way you're really getting your all. And not only are you giving it out in a more all encompassing way, but you're also learning from it better because you have the opportunity to observe. How many times have all of us been doing a thing or reading an article or something like that and something happens on the TV and it distracts you for a second and you gotta reread from the beginning of that paragraph because I, I know I read that paragraph. I have no clue what that paragraph was about. Could have been in a totally different language. No way of knowing. 
Like I was reading it, my eyes were moving and my brain was making noises inside of it. TV, just like one thing happened. I forgot 100% of what I just did, right? So it's like, <laughs> you, like that's the benefit of like non-distraction and uh, sometimes you call it like focus time or things like that in a, in a place of business, mm -hmm. right? But it's like sometimes you need to focus. There's benefits in that <clears throat> and uh, you know, some people back then didn't, but some people back then did focus and they were able to solve problems like lifting big ass rocks to a place. Because I would just pay a guy. I don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's probably My back hurts, dog. That. I don't want to lift big heavy rocks. <laughs> yeah, 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 that's not how I do that. So. <laughs> I got people for that. What's up, Justin? He's not listening to this, but that's what my brother does. He, he lifts heavy stuff for me. Yeah. He's, got, he's the got, strong Norgrove. I'm the we've smart Norgrove. two listeners, and he's not one of them. <laughs> no, I highly doubt it. <laughs> yeah. But either way, um, yeah, no, it's kind of dope when you think about, like, the level of, of astrological perfection one must be able to understand yeah. to be able to do that. And it really, it really educates that the ancients cared quite deeply about these things. Absolutely, absolutely. You know? And some of these chambers, or some of these passage tombs, um, you know, once it goes into the main chamber, they had additional offshoot chambers. And it was very common for them to have offshoot chambers that were basically, like, if you looked at it as a bird's eye view without the top on, <laughs> without the top on. What's up? Um, <laughs> it would look like an equilateral cross yeah. or a solar cross. I mean, when you think about it, that's an easy way to do it because you just go half and then half, you know, right? Yeah. So it's easy to, to lay it out that way. I don't know that it necessarily had any sort of historical significance, although it may have. The thing is, is we don't know. Um, but we do know that there's a whole bunch of, like, these uh, passage tombs that were not actually used as burial chambers so they weren't all essentially monuments to the dead in the way that you can think, you think of like, like some of them pyramid. were houses or something uh, i i think that they weren't houses but that they were more like places of worship like ah, imagine churches. a church that or or place of worship that you go to only on one day of the year cave church yeah uh, cave in church. fact we watched a documentary about an underground church mm -hmm. remember that in mm -hmm. like new zealand or yeah yeah somewhere so like, like that. yeah you know imagine that you're doing that and a lot of these whether they were used as a burial chamber or not as a burial chamber um had art carved into the stone um and these were mostly found in um like ancient ireland and um in England, but, uh, you know, they have these, like, really cool, like, spiral designs on a lot of the artwork that's in them. Just, like, whole huge stones. And I really love that, like, spiral kind of out, you know, artwork. But these were actually found not just in, in the UK, but they were found all throughout Europe and even into Northern Africa. So they were found on what we would see as basically the west or the yeah the western side of europe i don't know why whenever i want to talk about this i always like mix up my direct my directions but the, we find them on the western side i don't of know how guys europe i don't know it's I don't know. so crazy like i don't know yeah we Sometimes. were looking at a map the other day she was explaining this to me and we were looking at a map and she's like yeah over here in western europe and i'm just like <laughs> you just put it in like fucking russia dog <laughs> Yeah. Listen, when you start transitioning from potatoes to turnips, east. Yeah. Turnips equal yeah. east. So they were mostly found on like the the western side of this because like yeah. when you think about it, especially with like the way that the sun would rise and set, they're mostly situated on high up areas, so like tops of hills and yeah. stuff like that, yeah. so that they could catch the light. Yeah. Um, well, and it know. gives them a few seconds. I mean, if you're at, if you're at sea level and you got a perfectly even plane, first of all, like a tree would block your shit mm -hmm. right but but you've got to be like on the money right whereas if you're up in a hill and you're plus or minus one degree of grade or something yeah i mean yeah oh you're getting it <clears throat> like right as the sun's breaking the horizon maybe you're getting it oh it's a couple of minutes in but like you know it's still not even all the way like fresh because yeah. i mean theoretically you have the like transition from the very like beginning of the sun breaking to the end of the sun breaking and that gives you right some time, and yeah. that gives you some time to be like relatively accurate yeah plus if you put it up on a hill uh, you know you're you have less chance of being blocked mm -hmm. as well as the, there's more like grandeur like ah look up upon this dope shit we built 
Yeah, exactly. It took so, a year or two. So, um, passage tubes, a totally interesting thing that I learned yeah. about in Historical now, aside complete. Yeah, so now that being <laughs> said, that doesn't mean that every person who celebrated in bulk as a festival used these passage tombs. That's certainly not the yeah. case. Um, passage in fact, tomb sounds like some sort of necromantic teleportation system, right? Well, no, it sounds sort of like, like it Shadow sounds Star like Trek. a it sounds a world it sounds like a World of Warcraft expansion pack, you know, yeah, or like a, a like a dungeon. I just, in my like, mind, oh, I, I gotta think find of... a I gotta find a tank so that I can run passage tombs with the rest of my group. Oh, oh look at this loot I got yeah. off got off the last boss in passage tombs. Nah, I I, I, I think <laughs> in my head I think of like a like a person in like a black robe like hurriedly walking into a cave and just being like beep boop beep boop just poking bones being like this is where i need to go and then just <laughs> boof fire next passage to he walks out and he's just like oh my god i'm not late okay guys i'm sorry i i did this but i meant to do this <laughs> So I got the wrong address. They put me into a whole different passage tube. I was lost for like 20 minutes trying to get my way out. Yeah. So don't do this. It's do like this the passage one. tube switchboard. Yeah, you know, yeah. it's like it's like the like misdialing a phone number when you're a kid. <laughs> yeah, remember misdialing phone numbers? R remember knowing Ooh. phone numbers? Remember yeah. before phone numbers were weren't saved by the phone and you had to like be randomly tested by your parents endlessly about the phone number. I still remember <laughs> my phone number from when I was in kindergarten. Uh, in fact, the only reason that I know my phone number now is because it's connected to my Safeway club What's up? card. Safeway <laughs> causing us to remember phone numbers. Except that you don't um, know mine. That's fair. Yeah. But I don't have to so... use the Safeway card. So yeah. <laughs> I use Dad and I's Safeway's card. And no, I, I need those. I need those points. Those meat points, guys. Need those That's meat points. Meat points for yeah. all the steaks on the ceiling. Yeah, all the all steaks. the steaks. So um, a lot of people celebrated in bulk that didn't have access to or weren't going to do the passage tomb thing, uh, and it's very likely that um, the date for in bulk was not very much like it has to be halfway in between, but like having to do with weather and other resources. So if you had a particularly harsh winter. Um, you know, maybe you're celebrating in bulk on what is now like maybe the second week of February. Or if you had a very short winter, you may be celebrating a week or even two earlier just because kind of the, the way that nature does its thing. Because nature doesn't care about your calendar. She's just going to rain. Or she's yeah. not going to rain. It yeah. just depends on what happens. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so in bulk is one of those interesting ones because it's kind of like a floating sort of holiday that changes because it's not actually tied to a very specific astrological type of event like a full moon or a solstice or an equinox you know it's not exactly tied to that um but it was really popular to celebrate this even back as far as like ancient times and as early as even modern times but um in bulk became really popular in the like 16 1700s we're looking at really the popularity here got big into the uh, towards the tail ends of the renaissance and into the victorian times and even then they had bonfires and hearth fires which is like a fire in your fireplace. Uh, there were feasting and there were divination as really common ways to celebrate. Uh, and that's not unique to Imbolc. That's basically every Sabbath. You've got that sort of tie there. Yeah, yeah. certainly, certainly. But um, since the weather was getting better by this time of year, and we're talking to you on Imbolc, and it happens to be raining today, so it's kind of not really counting there, but a couple of days ago it wasn't raining. So since yeah. winter was mostly over by this point, it was also really popular to visit holy wells. And I know that holy wells are sort of like a Christian sort of a concept feeling, uh, but holy wells go back much much further than yeah. that and everybody, exists everybody got in blessed other, places where water yeah. just comes out of the earth that shit's important it's man. pretty miraculous i don't know if yeah. you've ever personally seen a stream burst forth i mean not like it just it wasn't there and all of a sudden it burst i've never seen that but i've seen like a spring that's just like out there yeah, and just it's like, just like it's just like a it's just coming out of the side of a mountain like yeah it's coming out of the side of a mountain if you've never yeah. seen anything like that yeah. in person like you yeah. know look for a park near you that has one because it is it is mind blowing yeah. to think that. To I've think even about been that. to some some like <clears throat> church springs that are like that. Yeah, yeah. I've been to the one in France where um, 
uh, like Mary showed herself to somebody and yeah. like, the statue cries or whatever. Yeah. Well, and yeah. there is a and holy you can collect well water and shit. Like I was blessed there and everything. It's, well. it's awesome, dude. Yeah, yeah, it's totally worth it. If you have the opportunity to go to a place like that, like definitely go to a place <clears> like that and like experience it, man. Yeah, when we evacuate, we still save that water in that little jar that he got from there. Yeah. Because that's an important evacuation thing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, St. Brigitte even has a well, a holy well dedicated oh, to awesome. her. I'm, yeah. not exa I'm not sure exactly where it is off the top of my head because I actually didn't write that down. But she's got one, and I don't know if it's at the place where her, like... You look it up, you comment below. Yeah, where that's her, her like, place is. But um, St. Brigid and Brigid, also known as Brigid or brig and any variety of that sounding of a word um, really appears first in Ir Irish folklore. And she is a member of the Tuatha de Danon, uh, which is essentially the fairies uh, and, and sort of like demigods and gods. They're sort of all encompassing Irish pantheon. Um, and she's actually the daughter of the Dagda. Yeah. And the Dagda is a patriarchal figure in the Tuatha de Dan in Irish folklore. If you were to take it and try to draw a line to other popular um, pantheons of mythology and belief, you could look at the Dagda being similar to uh, Odin or Zeus or perhaps even older than yeah. Zeus. You know, you're looking yeah. at a creator, sort of all-knowing yeah. father, Top patriarchal the figure there. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so she was the daughter of the Dagda. So she's actually pretty high up there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and she represents a lot of stuff. And we'll get in more to the correspondences with um, we'll, with this holiday we'll, we'll later. We'll do a bit but... just on the Tuatha Dé Danann. They're, they are fantastic. Um, there's a really great book series that I read that, that like, deeply relates it. It's a, um, a, um, Iron Druid Chronicles. Mm. I really, really like it. I've reread the first three books, like, four times now, I think. Yeah. You know? And, and, and that, 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 like directly connects with the Tuatha Dé Danann, but I would love to do and and let me know, you know, comment below or, or whatever. Reach out to us on social uh, if you would like looks like deep looks into um, specific cultures folklore. Well, we're definitely going to do that because so, after reading about Brigid the goddess, yeah. as well as Saint Brigid, some people um, are going to do singular am... dives. Some some people will do yeah. overarching dives. I mean, you know, a lot yeah. of these gods and goddesses and and whatnot. Um, you know, fey folk and such re would would require really like e like they deserve their own whole podcast. Yeah, so and we're not even like experts or nothing. Like, yeah, you know, we got day a, jobs. Maybe maybe a podcast <laughs> with like a um with like a, somebody zoom called in to talk with us for a little bit interview section. Oh, style. that would be yeah. super cool. If you're a specialist in uh, in any particular esoteric uh, godliness or folklore or anything like that, hit us up. Yeah, hit us up. Yeah, hit we us would up. Love 100%. to do something like we'll that. We'll do an interview and everything. So, uh, Brigid represents spring, obviously, uh, based on what we're talking about. And spring means fertility. So she's also a fertility goddess. Mm -hmm. She is considered a patron goddess of livestock, uh, particularly cattle and uh, pigs. Uh, pigs... Um, you could consider them livestock. They're a wild boar. And I don't think that she would necessarily be a goddess of, say, a wild boar, but she would be of a domesticated pig. Mm -hmm. She's kind of like a like a like a home time sort of thing. She's also the goddess of arts and crafts. Like very specifically crafts, which is interesting. That's not usually a a a, a thing for for a god or a goddess is to be like a goddess of crafts. I just think of like Martha Stewart going like, "Oh, Brigid, give me." I she mean, sold her soul to Brigid. That's I how mean, Martha I mean, Stewart got where but, she but, was. But the thing is, is you got to think about from like a story standpoint. Like, if it was just the telephone game and you couldn't like rewatch episodes. You know, it would only take a couple of hundred years before somebody like Martha Stewart would almost be classified as as oh, yeah. some sort of a patron saint of arts and crafts oh, or, or, or whatnot, right? Yeah. And that's just because of the evolution of the way the stories move. I sort of love the fact that she's the she's the like yeah. a, like a saint or god of something like arts and crafts, and especially when you think about its relation to like spring and fertility and livestock and all this other yeah. stuff. Well, and there's more. You know, she's yeah. also the goddess of poetry, uh, emotion. emotion. <laughs> Probably. Yeah. Uh, and healing and blacksmithing and also the goddess of high things. Uh, but not necessarily for 20 high. 
High things. High things. Uh, but thinking physically high things, right? You know, we were talking about these passage tombs being built like on the top of a clouds hill. Clouds and birds. Uh, and or, like, and really mentally, tall trees. You know, she was uh, associated with philosophy and spirituality and, high things. you know, high things. So, yeah. you know, high things. Yeah. Sometimes um, you gotta. So, yeah, yeah she's the yeah. goddess of high things. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. <clears throat> um, th- we just had to take a little break there. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so we're back. Um, so Brigid may have actually been portrayed as a triple deity, um, too, which is really interesting. A lot of a lot of mythos and a lot of religion. Like Total Recall. No, that's triple boobs. Um, nice try. Um, that's, that's triple, is it triple titty instead of triple deity? So, um, it's a really common theme, (coughs) excuse me, for female, um, for female, uh, like goddesses in a different, in different mythoses to be portrayed as triple deities, signifying mother, maiden, crone, three steps there. Um, but Brigid actually has two sisters in some folklore interpretations and all three of them are named Brigid. Nice. Yeah. Uh, And her two sisters were worshipped separately for healing and blacksmithing before she had healing and blacksmithing as one of her associations. So it is most likely that she was a triple goddess as opposed to having uh, sisters in that respect. Um, So that's, um, you know, at some point those associations were merged into one. And then at some point, Brigid was syncretized, which means that she was essentially turned into a saint. Um, And that's not to say that Saint Brigid wasn't a real person, uh, because there is a lot of information about Saint Brigid and the life that she lived and when she lived and when she died and that sort of thing. But at some point, Brigid turned into Saint Brigid. And this is really looking at the Christianization of those sort of pagan things. It's a lot easier to get that blend over um, there and a lot easier to rule people when you have the same, um, you know, thing that they're worshiping. Uh, If you're not sure about how that works, listen to the Yule podcast. (laughs) Um, They really go into that. Now, um, Saint Brigid is associated with some different things than the goddess Brigid. Um, so Saint Brigid is really associated with like holy wells and a perpetual sacred flame. She's not particularly associated with any of the other stuff that Brigid the goddess is. So you're looking at a very, de- you know, defined line there and you're looking at a line that really just exists in they share the same name only. So uh, I personally find it sort of hard to believe that she was syncretized into St. Brigid because of the stories of Brigid the Saint Uh, as well as the things that Brigid uh, the Goddess were. You know, same name. Same name. Right right back time, right back channel kind Mm -hmm. of a thing. So... Yeah. You know, in uh, fact, um, St. Brigid has a sanctuary. Time and that's travelers. in. Comment um, below. Let us know what, what you think. <laughs> time travel shenanigans. Yeah. Um, she has a sanctuary in, um, I'm going to say it wrong. <clears throat> it looks like Kildare, but I think it's Kildare. Oh, it's Kildare Ireland. Ireland. Yeah. Uh, and she has uh, nuns who still keep her sacred perpetual flame going. That's what that particular sanctuary is known for is having a sacred flame. So every time I was, so every time I've thought about this, including now in my mind, I'm like that eternal flame song. Mm. Like, is this burning? Let's not get corporate attacked here. Let's, let's not get corporate attacked here. Okay, uh, okay, okay, okay. So um, That's a horrible song, by the way. <laughs> Everybody should feel bad. Yeah. Real shit song. <clears throat> so there's this weird sort of bleed over with Brigid the Goddess and Saint Brigid. And then also, speaking of triple deities, of the Brigid that was traditionally worshipped during Imbolc once the Middle Ages came around. Really, there's sort of three separate people who are actually one person that were that were um, worshiping which is really interesting because um santa and jesus not the same person if you're thinking about yule to draw a comparison line there <clears throat> so it was said that in the middle ages that brigid would visit families on imbolc eve so that's actually last night imbolc was supposed to go from sundown the night before to sundown the next night mm-hmm. so imbolc is kind of one of those weird timing ones but 
It was said that she would visit families on Imbolc Eve. They would typically uh, symbolically invite her, either of like her essence, her spirit, her presence, or there would be a member of the family or of the town that was dressed up as St. Brigid, and they would then invite that person into their home. And uh, then Brigid would have a set a place at the table. She would have a meal. If you didn't have a person acting as Brigid, you would generally just have what is called like a silent dinner for her. So you just have like a whole plate prepared. Um, and it was also really common to make a bed for her. Mm -hmm. And in some areas it, where they didn't have, you know, the luxury of an extra room, it was very common to... <laughs> I mean, Some areas, this area, we don't have an extra. We room. definitely don't. I have can't an extra build room. a bed for Brigid. I mean, unless she's like this big. She's Maybe this she's big. This big. Maybe Bam. she's tiny. I got a bed, no problem. Like, is that like six inch action figure size? Yeah. Brigid with the with the kung fu grip. Yeah. She's so got that, she's got that <laughs> the kung fu switch chop. in her spine that causes her to karate chop. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> it's just like light switch knob coming out the back of one of your GI Joes. So yeah. in areas where they didn't have the luxury of an extra bed or even the place to put a symbolical extra bed, they would actually just make up a bed of sorts in the barn. Uh, and in there they would usually have like a sheet or a blanket laid out and she would have like a little table with a little candle that's a fire hazard uh, and <laughs> look you put the candle a out glass for her of water. don't light the candle she's capable of lighting the candle on her own right yeah. don't light the candle then you don't have to worry about your house burning down Exactly. This is our this is our standard talk on fire safety. Uh, it you'll seems get used like it happens it. every single episode. Yeah. This fire safety thing. So um, so before before people would go to bed themselves. So, so like after they invited Brigid and had dinner and set out a little bed for her to sleep in, um, the people would set out strips of cloth outside for her to bless. So not a garment, but like a strip of cloth, as in like that's what you would use as a bandage mm -hmm. or. Or something along those lines uh, because these strips of cloth were purported to have healing powers as well as protective powers so like um, you know are you working in working in the fields with your livestock and stuff uh, you know you you got like a, a headband that you wear like maybe you put that outside and where people put it outside was kind of like wherever you had space but it was most commonly put on the bush outside of your door um, so <laughs> you get like spike bush. Um, <clears throat> yeah, man. Yeah. And people also made a bright dog doll, um, out of rushes or reeds, uh, sometimes, uh, wheat and straw. That's really m much more modern because back in the middle ages and even the Victorian times, you may not have had extra straw left over from your harvest in the fall. So sure. rushes and reeds are kind of something that grow year round and they're also, um, you know, wet. So they're much more pliable, um, and they would make this doll to symbolize her. So they would decorate it with like a dress and like bits of cloth and ribbons and flowers and shells and beads and it would be all pretty. And um, this is another one of those ones where it depends on the community that you live in. So sometimes the doll was taken uh, door to door and young girls would visit the house and sometimes boys would visit too. Sometimes they had like basically a boy doll um, to sort of act as Brigid's companion. Um, <clears throat> and if they visited every house, then y they were basically going wassailing, but without the booze. <laughs> they were kind of oh, going that terrible. Awful. Yeah, they would go and they would sing hymns door to door. And then if you were, you know, one of the doors that they knocked on, you were supposed to give them something or place something on the doll to decorate the doll. Otherwise, you would be. You know, and in, in not in not in Brigitte's good graces. I mean, listen, I like candy, I guess, but um, <laughs> I think I would rather the Halloween tradition, guys, be that we get to decorate a doll when we go door to door. It sounds very creepy, and like I'm all for it. Yeah, I'm it's super too into bad it. that we don't have the ability to really trick or treat around us. We don't really have neighbors, so, um, and they would also so young girls would also put the bright dog doll representing Brigid to bed. Sometimes in the bed that was made up for her, sometimes in a small little plot of straw somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of like Elf in a Shelf, but it's Brigid in a bed. Yeah, it's not as rhymy. It works. Sadly. Yeah. Bring it into bed. <laughs> I was proud I mean, of it. Yeah. I'll sell those dolls. I'll make a million bucks. I'm not going to complain. <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so for crafts, Brigid's crosses were also really popular, and those are woven in an equilateral cross. E equilateral cross Woo. There you go. Um, or a solar cross again out of reeds or rushes sometimes you see them in straw they're really cool and they're really fun to make um, if you get a chance go ahead and google brigade cross and um, you can find probably a whole bunch of different ways to make yeah. them instructional videos instructional on how to do videos that. and stuff yeah. and those were typically placed above a door for protection uh, so the door that you walk into a place um, not necessarily a door inside of your home mm -hmm. and it and what you did is you would put it above and then you leave it up there all year round until next in bulk and then at in bulk you take down your old one put up your new one and then you symbolically burn the old one as a way of banishing winter uh, a really common sort of theme in bo in like the three spring sabbats is mm -hmm. burning stuff to banish winter away um, and it's a uh, it's a really popular time for weather divination too so Groundhog Day, woo! Don't yeah. drive angry. Um, <laughs> yeah, man. So traditionally, in ancient Irish folklore, in bulk was when the. Oh no. What? The, Kai Kailik. Uh, apparently, I apparently I wrote this word. The Kailik. Kailik. No, I mean that says Kailik. But... The Kailik. I don't know that that's actually a word. Um, it definitely is. I wrote the word down and looked at the pronunciation and was like, clearly, I will remember how dude, to say this. Dude, put because the, I did not put, put parentheses. The, put the how to how to say it noises. I normally do. Yeah. But I thought yeah. I I looked at it and was like, I'm gonna remember how to say this. I mean, it looks like it says Kalich. I'm gonna go with Kalich. It's with a C. Um, is when, so yeah, in bulk is when the Kalich gathers her firewood for the rest of the winter. So this is kind of like a weird little Irish mythological thing that is there. So it it's yeah. said that if it's sunny on in bulk, she's out getting firewood. So you're in for a long winter because she's gathering firewood, yeah. indicating that she knows that it's going to be a long winter. Yeah. But if it's rainy. It means that she's asleep, and because she's asleep, she's not getting firewood, which means that winter will be over soon. So well, basically, we're looking at was I'm just saying, this deity lazy it's or rain, not? It's raining right now. Sounds like uh, our winter's going to end soon. I mean, it's California. Our winter's basically over by now. Yeah, it's it's and then we're rain. and then we it's more, time for It's not good. We need more rain. And then it's time for the second of many false springs. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. California hopefully, is hopefully rife with false springs. Hopefully you don't have allergies. Woof. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's kind of a fun one. But I mean that really like calls back to the groundhog side of things. Like, you know, if the groundhog peeks its little head out of the hole and sees the sees its shadow, that means that we're in for a long winter and then vice versa. So sure. that's sort of um, you know, very historical. And some of these divination methods were uh, a lot more tied to the way that livestock was going. So people this is sort of the earliest time of year that livestock would be giving birth to new animals mm -hmm. and this was mm -hmm. actually in ancient times a very popular time for divination based on afterbirth uh for livestock yeah. and that's it's a very interesting way that they do that, but also very like witch doctory. Um, there's not a lot of information about that, but that was very popular, and it sort of went out of, you know, popularity as um, you know less and less people had livestock and were there for it and were looking for these kind of omens and stuff like that. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> let's uh, let's go div do some divination with some. Placenta, I guess. Placental divination. I mean, why the heck not, right? Well, plus, when you think about it, right, you're going to start having more... You're going to start seeing, like, early babies getting born yeah. in your livestock and in your critters around, <coughs> you know, the <clears throat> neighborhood. Um, so that sort of makes sense. It does. Right? It, because, yeah. you know, like we said at the top, you know, like, our chickens are starting to lay eggs again. Yeah. You know, pretty rapidly, even though right now it's raining outside. But, like, 
it, it makes sense when you sort of think about it. It does, you know? it does. And egg divination was also very popular during this time of year because eggs are starting to be laid again. Uh, so that was also very popular. There's many, many, many different ways to do egg divination, which we will not cover here. But um, you're basically looking at like a couple of different methods of egg divination. It's what happens when you spin it. Uh, and then it's what happens when you hold it in your hand or put it under your pillow or mm. something. Mm. Uh, and then the last one is like, what happens when you crack it open? So there's a lot of different ways that egg divination sort of goes and it's pretty interesting. Um, so divination was very, very popular this time of year. Not so much love divination though. You would think there would be more of that because of its proximity to Valentine's yeah. Day. Wow. But Valentine's Day is a very modern holiday and it love in the love as like a, a theme for a Sabbath didn't really roll around until Beltane. Yeah. And even Ostara um, at the earliest there. But um, with Candlemas being the next day, it's a more modern tradition for people to make or bless candles for the coming year. So that's kind of a fun one. So if you've got like a bunch of candles or if you want to have like a fun sort of rainy day witchy project like get you some candles and then bless them or even <coughs> charge intentions in them for future use yeah carve symbols into them or something like that um i just like I love the idea of sitting at a table and just like going through like a witchy stockpile of candles and then putting them into several really cool apothecary drawers. So that's definitely a fun. I get it. I get it. I mean, we literally <laughs> vaguely just did that. So yeah, we did. Like a couple of days ago, I watered one of the trees back here, and um, just water ran out the bottom. Sometimes that happens. And um, and so we ended up having to pull off the cloth that we had underneath it. And redo our whole just altar space. Everybody, yeah, just all, all the altar spaces are different. You know, changed a little bit of the layout around. Which is perfect because our everything was still very solidly Yule. Yeah. And now it's it's more refreshed. So we try to redo yeah. our altar space with a, every Sabbath. We've got Sabbath. a new plant friend here. <coughs> yeah, it's, you can a, see that plant. it's a pretty little purple tulip. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's also really popular, even back going into ancient times, to choose and bless the seeds that are going to be used in the coming growing season. Um, when you get seeds in a packet now, most of those seeds are good to go. They're not necessarily duds. Uh, but back in the day, when you had to like make your own seeds, like you would have to dry them for a while. So you basically are drying them over the winter months. And then in the sp in early spring, you're going to pull them out and look at them and discard the ones that are like, you know, when you eat a watermelon and you have one of those, like a seedless watermelon, you have one of those white seeds that isn't actually like anything in it's it. It's not like a real seed. Yeah. yeah. So basically like that. Um, so that's a really, that's another fun way. If you are like a plant witch or anything like that, you want to do some gardening, you know, maybe go and look at some seeds mm -hmm. and purchase some seeds. When you get them in, do a nice little ritual to bless them for an abundant harvest or abundant whatever it is that you're trying to grow uh, for the year. And that's a really fun way to kind of have intention behind what it is that you're doing, but also add that magical intention, which is just like mm, the yeah, chef's kiss. That's what you want. It's the salt bay on your, yeah. <laughs> on your well yearly things. It's a little bit, little bit extra, <coughs> a little boost. Yeah, a little boost, a little boost. Uh, and one thing that we like to do actually is thawing ice and using that water as holy water for the rest of the year. We have a, a ritual that we do for Imbolc, which uh, we're probably not going to do this year just because we kind of forgot and have been busy. But um, where we get a big block of ice and then we thaw it in a container, you know, like a pot or like something. Pot, yeah. uh, and uh, essentially look at the thawing of the ice as the ending of winter and the beginning of spring and the nourishment that the snow melt um, brings. In yeah. California, we're all very interested in how much how much snow the snowpack has because that gives water to a lot of our state. We, so, we need water. so or, But not too much. No. Just enough. <laughs> yeah, just 
just right. We need right. water, but just, just the we right need amount. The Not too much. Level. Yeah. yeah. So we like to do We're that. Asking for a lot. <laughs> of course, when you're looking at that sort of thing, um, you know, you're thawing ice or even collecting moon water. This is our sort of like every podcast, I guess, we have to talk about food safety too. Like, no. don't drink that water. Yeah. Don't don't, don't save don't it. Don't do that. Yeah. Like, don't just, don't. just if you leave a cup outside, that cup's not for drinking no more. Yeah. You gotta wash yeah. that cup. You put fresh water in that cup, you don't die from the water. Yeah, there are a lot of it's diseases the future. that it's can happen in water. It's the future, guys. We know this stuff. <laughs> right? Now, if you want to do this, something like that with drinkable water for magical purposes, yeah. get yourself a case of bottled water. Yeah. Or get yourself, you know, get like a, a nice jug glass of bottled vessel. water. Don't, don't. D don't heat cycle a bottle in bottled water. It's oh, no, I'm you. talking about but buying, like, like, a plastic bottle of water. Yeah, I, I mean, know, I know. Yeah. But, like, you, know, you can put it, if you have, a, if you have a, like, a, one of those nice glass, you know, c coffee cup kind of things, you know, thermoses or whatever yeah. the fuck, right? Put that water in that, seal that up, leave that outside, moon charge the shit out of that. It's still fine water, right? It's, it's in glass, it was sealed, <laughs> closed. But, but you only gotta, if you drink it right away. Yeah, don't yeah. save water. <clears throat> yeah, if you're looking for something that you Drinking can... Drinking water is right away water. <laughs> well, if you're looking for something that you can bless now and use throughout the year, using Imbolc as, like, sort of a stock up um, mm -hmm. Sab it. Get yourself a case of water, like mm -hmm. like drinking water, bottled water. It's actually a good idea to have on hand if you don't have any, just because you never know when some sort of a disaster is going to strike. Again, we are from oh. California. We got floods. We got fires. We got earthquakes. We got mudslides. Yeah. What you want? We got all yeah. those disasters. No, it's, um, it's not great. It's, I mean, we, we pay a hefty price. It's very pretty here. out here, though. Let me tell you what. Very pretty. We live yeah. in the Redwoods. It's awesome. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's a really fun one that you can do with, with water and the stockpiling and stuff. Uh, but Imbolc is really about this whole idea of, like, spring is coming, the year is new. So you're looking at renewing things. So Imbolc is a really interesting sort of sabbat because the sabbats sort of have a idea behind them that on this one you're purging stuff and on this one you're welcoming forces into your life but Imbolc is sort of like a dual purpose one mm -hmm. so think about what it is that you want to shed and leave behind a la a melting piece of ice yeah. and think of it think of what it is that you want to manifest and grow a la a seed you know take some time to think about what's going to really help nourish you for the next year, what's going to help you grow and shed the things that aren't necessary for you anymore. Yeah. 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 Totally. Totally. So, correspondences. My favorite part! So, um, I'm going to go through a list of the things that are correspondences for in bulk itself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we're going to start with animals. So, we're looking at uh, livestock in spring and and that sort of animals so robin or any other birds that are absent in the winter but come back for the spring yeah. um i mean i guess geese if you want to get into geese why not super, why not super vicious so. i mean letter kenny's really into that canadian Hardcore. goose Hardcore. so yeah. you know i'm not gonna hate on that uh burrowing animals um not so much rabbits but uh, they do burrow, so, you know, like foxes and stuff like that, because animals are starting to come out of burrows during this time of year. Same thing for hibernation with, like, bears. Uh, and, of course, you're looking at other livestock, so you're looking at oxen and cattle and sheep and lamb yeah. and uh, perhaps chickens as well, if you count those as livestock. They kind of are. Um, for colors, you're looking at pretty much the colors of Valentine's Day. You're looking at white. That's the color of the snow. That's the color of the clouds. You're looking at pink um, because it's pink. <laughs> and you're looking at red again because it's red. I think that that may tie back to the nature of this being the time of year where an animals are starting to be born again. Yeah, I think that's what that means. 100%. <laughs> totally, totally. Yeah. Uh, and you're also looking at light blue. Yeah. Uh, light blue being the color of the sky when there are no clouds and, um, and so forth. For stones and crystals, we're looking at bloodstone again. We're looking at garnet, that deep red. We're looking at ruby and we're also looking at uh, turquoise. So it kind of mirrors those colors mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. Um, for herbs, I cut out a bunch of these because I didn't want to read like five minutes worth of herbs. But here are the main beats. It's the <laughs> herb hour. The herb Guys, hour. We're just going to read the names of herbs. For an hour. Yeah. 
Don't yeah. make us do that. We I bet you that. if Nick Offerman did that, he would get a ton of views. I'd probably, I'd probably listen we to that. We would probably. Yeah, I'd, I'd we listen, we did his we hour. did his whiskey thing. We watched yeah, that. It was yeah. dope. It was, it was pretty dope. good. Um, so herbs, we're looking at angelica, bay, basil, iris, daffodil, heather, violets, and any white or yellow flowers. Think about what's in season right now. Think about what's growing in the world. I know um, for us, we're just starting to see little green shoots here. And uh, we'll probably be seeing our, our daffodils and tulips and crocuses soon. It's still a little bit early. We've had kind of like a late onset to winter. Yeah. Um, but any of those sort of flowers there. <clears throat> for uh, incense, you want to be looking for a combination of woodsy and flowery. You want to really get a scent that reminds you of spring is coming. So something like cedar and rose or pine and chamomile, mm -hmm. uh, sage and geranium, mm -hmm. something that's got that sort of dual purpose there to fit with the whole um, inlay of Imbolc. And for foods, again, you're looking at seasonal stuff. So what would they have had available to eat back in the Middle Ages? Well, they would have had dairy, they would have had seeds and nuts. Um, they would have had peppers and onions and garlic and potatoes. Those keep really well. Same thing with dried fruit. Mm -hmm. the, some things are just starting to, um, you know, grow again, but you would still have like, you know, baked goods is probably a big portion of what you would have. Mm -hmm. So like muffins and bread and cookies and stuff like that. Um, and traditional drinks would be like milk and herbal teas and spiced wine. You're kind of like getting to the end of the larder there, but you're starting to get things coming into it. So it's sort of like that, that bridge there. Uh, and then lastly for deities, again, I cut this list a lot because like herb hour is like shortly followed by deity hour. We'll there do both. is a lot. We'll do both. Yeah. <laughs> we'll do yeah. both. Yeah. We'll like put it to I mean, some that, dumb you know, stuff. And, and that's the thing, right? Like if, if we didn't say the herb or deity by which you, you think of, uh, first of all, share that with the community so that they know about yeah. that particular herb or deity that we did not say. Um, but also, you know, it's not on purpose. It's just that you would like to leave at some point in time. So yeah, we don't want to be here for several hours. I mean, we it can be. Fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but we got like dinner time to do. That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and like the, wrestling to yeah. happen. And we've We're got already these like cut delicious little veggie sticks, and Ugh, they Gouda they're and black pepper. really they're good. So good, man. But it's like. It's sort of like air that's been spun around a paste and then air fried. So yeah. it doesn't have a lot of, you know, there's no food in that. Calorie density. No, it's mostly no food. flavor that you're putting into your mouth. Yeah. Um, so, so deities uh, Arachne, Athena, Brigid, of Obviously. course, uh, Bronwen, Gaia, Februa, who was a uh, Roman and Greek of sort of thing. Lupercalia, very interesting festival. We'll talk about that at some point. Inanna, Lucina, Vesta, and Cupid or Eros. I know earlier I said that this holiday isn't really no about love, love but- um, Secret time, a little bit of love stuff. A little bit of love stuff. Give it some love stuff. Yeah. Be chill. Be chill. So that's your Imbolc. For us, we're going to be celebrating a pretty chill Imbolc. We'll probably light some candles, yeah. leave out some food as offerings. Yeah. We made some delicious nachos the other night, and we still have some leftovers. So we're doing leftover nachos as offerings. I think that they would approve. Yeah, nachos are delicious. <laughs> Dude, homemade cheese sauce. It's the way to go. Yeah. Fuck the cans. We'll probably do a little bit of divination, maybe some card pulls, yeah. and yeah. Uh, leave a candle burning up until we go to bed. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, welcome that spring back. Yeah, 100%, 100%, yeah. But, uh, yeah, you know what? Um, like, if, if you want to share, let us know what you're doing for in bulk. And, uh, you know, have a good in bulk. Be prepared for next year. Um, and, uh, we'll catch you guys later. For our next show. Yeah, we'll catch you guys for the next one. So, I don't, we don't, I don't know what that is right we now. We haven't decided yeah, yet. I haven't decided that. If you got any yeah. ideas, Yeah, if you got a thing, do that. Hey, also, don't forget to like this video, comment below, share, subscribe, do all that kind of stuff. We have a Patreon now. I figured that out. Yeah. Let me tell you what. So, uh, yeah, if you like us and would like us to do this, but a little bit better, 
you know. Hit us up on our social media. Hit Let us, us know. On social media. Nerdjive.com is where you can find all of the links all to the everything. All the links. Nerdjive.com. Everything's there. So go there. But uh, yeah, either way, I have been John Norgrove. This has been Julie Norgrove. This is the Horn and Cauldron podcast. podcast. Yeah. So uh, we'll catch you guys on the flip side. <laughs>